Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I am your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Todd Dexheimer. Thanks for being on the show, Todd. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, Todd is the owner of Venture D Properties. Um, Todd's a, a very experienced syndicator. Uh, he came from, he was a school teacher and uh, got into real estate. Uh, I met Todd uh, at the conference, uh, Joe Fairless's best ever conference in Denver, which I highly recommend going to. But, you know, Todd and I talked for a while and he was telling me about how he got in the syndication business. You know, and I asked him, you know, how'd you get in? How'd you, how'd you get started? And, and he was just like, I, I just made it happen. I just learned it and made it happen. And I, anyway, I really appreciate people that just kind of, can jump in and make things happen and don't let obstacles or uh, get in their way or make excuses. And so I appreciated that about Todd and, and uh, Todd, why don't you fill us in a little bit uh, on how you did get in the syndication business? Uh, yeah. So like you said, just kind of made it, <laughs> made it happen. I had to do it. Right. And, and I wanted to do it. Uh, so starting in real estate, I'll, I'll kind of start with, with real estate. So starting in real estate, I didn't really have much money. And which is probably the case for most of the people listening. I, I just didn't have that much money and I had to figure out how I was going to get started. So I bought a rental property. I had some money to do that. And then I, but I wanted to continue. I didn't want to be just this one off, uh, you know, rental property owner. I wanted to own thousands of units. Like that was my goal from day one. So in order to do that, I started bringing in money almost right away. I had to figure that out, had to, bring in partners uh, at different levels. And, and so that's always been since almost since day one, part of the, part of the deal is I've got to bring in other people's money. And I flipped a lot of houses and through flipping, instead of using hard money, uh, I would use private money and, and they would, they were my, you know, my investors and then we would do flips and, uh, just continue like that. And as I bought my rental portfolio, the same thing, I, I would buy them cash, but I would use other people's money for the, for the cash. And then I would refinance them into a bank loan. And, and so I just continued to always need and use other people's money. And even when I didn't necessarily need it, as it went on, I said, well, I want to keep these relationships. I want to keep these relationships growing. So instead of using a bank loan, cause as time went on, banks started loosening up and, and they would actually lend a, a flipper. And so they would lend to me as I would go in and buy it and do a flip. And I did use some bank loans, but I wanted to continue to use my investors. Uh, even though it cost more, uh, I just wanted to keep that relationship going. So that was always a key critical part of my business is just having private lenders. So then when I decided to go into the uh, multifamily investments, it was, you know, hey, I, I could take my rental portfolio. I could sell majority of, or, of my houses or maybe all of my, my, I had a bunch of one to four families and I had some other smaller apartments. So I thought, well, I could sell all that stuff and go buy an apartment or two with my own money. Well, that's fine. But instead of doing that, let's bring on investors and, and then I'm not going to, worry about that. I'll just start buying with my investors because that's what I've always done. And so it just made a lot of sense. Plus I enjoy making other people money. Um, it's fun for me to be able to write that check to an investor for, you know, uh, for a flip. It's, you know, you're writing them a check for, let's just call it $12,000. And, uh, and when you give them that check, it's like, sweet, that this, this happened. Let's do that again. You know, so I enjoy writing those checks and, and paying the investors and that relationship building is, is just a lot of fun. So. Nice. So you, you said you started raising money or using other people's money from the very beginning. How did you build that confidence in those investors when you, you know, you're just getting started in the business? Um, yeah, I, you know, that was, that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, I think it was just my determination. Like, look, this is, and, and my comment, I, I try to take a common sense approach. Like, you know, look, here's, here's what we're doing. This is step A, B, C, D. And, and here's why it works. And you show them the numbers and you show them, 
the research that you've done and you say, here's why it works. Here's what we're doing. And here's who I am. And the who I am really wasn't much of a sell because anybody who knows me knows, you know, my integrity and and knows that I'm not going to do anything with their money that, you know, they would even question. So I know that was a, that was a really easy sell that part, but then just understanding the business plan, I think is really important as well. What are you doing? And, and can we articulate that business plan to the investors properly? And, um, was it a little difficult at first? Yeah, it definitely was, but I think people understood it. And, and like I said, you articulate it right. And, and you just have, that integrity behind you and, and it's going to help a lot. Could you elaborate on a little bit about like, I mean, of course you're a lot more experienced now, but help, help the ones that are not, not as experienced as you, but are in those shoes that, you know, okay, we need to go to that investor and we need to be able to show them the numbers, how it works and who we are, just like you talked about. But how would you instruct them on approaching that conversation now? How would I instruct the, the, the new investor? Right somebody just getting into this business, having those conversations, you know, you're a lot more experienced now. What would that conversation look like now? Yeah. So uh, for, first of all, you've got to, it's going to be a slightly different for every person because everybody's got a different backstory. Everybody's got different strengths. Everybody's got, you know, so, so you've got to really latch onto your strengths and then your relationship and, and how are you going to be successful? I think one of the, uh, and, and I already said this, you've got to be able to tell the story that the, the business plan, what are we doing? Why is it going to work? Why is it going to work for you? Cause for me, I've got different strengths than, you know, somebody else might have. So what are your strengths and how are you filling those holes too? You know, what are you going to do to fill those holes? And I think when we're talking about an apartment syndication, it's different than a flip. Um, so we're talking about this apartment syndication. We're trying to raise, um, whatever a million dollars or whatever it is. We've got to raise from a lot of different people. And so we've got to be able to tell the story. Why is this property from the start to finish gonna, gonna work? What, what's going to happen to it? Do I really understand everything? Quite frankly, investors will look you're going to have different types of investors, but investors will look at your numbers, but most of them won't really analyze your numbers and dig into them. That's not the most important thing for them. That They don't care that you're getting a an 18% return versus a 16.5% return. That's not what they're looking at. They're looking at what's the story? Is this story make sense for this property? Does it sound good? And then who is the team? Who are the people behind this thing? So that's what you've got to talk about. You know, who, who are you and why can you make this work? And if you're going, hey, I got no experience. How am I going to tell? Well, first of all, maybe you're, you're not the right person or you should have the right people in place. Okay. So do you have the right partners? Maybe you have business partners for it. Maybe you have the right team. Um, everything to me needs to be in place. Syndication, and I know this is a syndication show, uh, syndication is not something to be taken lightly. I think we, anybody who does the business or wants to get in the business needs to understand like this is other people's money you're dealing with. And you need to be very serious about that when you go to deal with that. So, um, did I answer your question? I don't know. <laughs> you did. You did. <laughs> I, you know, I appreciate you elaborating on, you know, you, you've got to be able to tell the story. You got to know what your strengths are. Um, why is the property going to work? And just do you really understand everything? Um, no, I, I really appreciate that. And so why, why multifamily syndication over staying in the flipping business? You're very experienced at flipping. Why not grow that business and, and just stay, you know, just pushing forward there? Why move over to multifamily syndication? Yeah, good question. Uh, because to me, flipping is a it, it, flipping is an okay business if you can systematize it properly. But even with that, it's just a lot of head damage, at least in my experience. And maybe I just didn't systematize it quite properly. I know people that do well in it, but you're, it's a, such a transactional business. And I didn't want to be in the transactional business. By that, I mean, you're always buying and selling. 
Mm. And in multifamily, yes, are you always buying and selling? Yes. But instead of buying and selling, you know, a hundred properties, um, well, probably 50 properties a year, all you need to buy is, you know, two, three, that's it. Oh, maybe even one a year uh, and you're fine. And then you're, you know, you're not starting out selling every single year. As you get big enough, you might be doing one sale a year, maybe two. Um, but it's a lot less transactional and it's more, we're building this business and we're expanding upon this business. To me, it's more sustainable business plan, business model. And the other thing is I noticed that the return on investment in my flips versus my rentals, the, the rentals were actually better than the flips as far as a pure ROI standpoint. So why do this, all this head damage when I could focus on the rentals and get the same return or better uh, on the investment for my investors? So Nice. Boy. And then uh, you I like why? the stability too. Sorry about interrupting, but I like the stability of, of multifamily uh, versus flipping. Flipping is just not stable, right? If you get caught in a down cycle when you bought a, uh, you know, five properties, um, you know, those five properties might be going away unless you have, let's say half a million dollars to sustain that. Uh, multifamily, sure. Could you get caught in a down cycle? Absolutely. But there's a lot more things I think you can put in place to mitigate mitigate that risk. So sorry about interrupting. Go ahead. No, it's okay. Um, tell us about your first syndication deal. Uh, so first true full syndication deal. Um, oh boy. I mean, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> Raised uh, just under a million dollars on the deal. Um, it was a you know, value add, multifamily value add. Um, and... Yeah, I, I mean, it was it's um, out of state deal that it did, um, value add, and yeah, it was just under. I think it was just under a million dollars. So for that, how far away was that property from you? Um, two hour plane flight. Oh, okay, okay. So, <laughs> what gave you the confidence to to purchase such a you know I really do a syndication? How many units was it? Sure, uh, it was just under a hundred. I've got. Um, properties nearby. So I already, okay. ha I already owned properties, you know, within, within an hour of, of that property. And, uh, the other thing is I really liked what the fundamentals of the market, what's going on there, the affordability of the market, uh, not only from a purchasing standpoint, but a, for a tenant standpoint. And I really like that is kind of what I've been focusing on lately is I'm trying to find markets that are fairly affordable for tenants. Um, and are also have opportunity for me. And then coupled with that, they have to have a pop, strong population growth, uh, which I feel is sustainable uh, along with, uh, you know, job growth, which I feel is sustainable as well. So you got to kind of pile all that together. You can't have to me one without the other. Um, there are markets that have great cash flow that have negative population growth. To me, that's not a market I want to be in. Uh, so yeah, uh, that was the market made a lot of sense and, and I had properties in the area and, uh, and just great fundamentals. So, so you already had a team in place. You were used to traveling there. So really it yeah. wasn't a big deal to purchase another property in that area. You were just right. doing a different business still, but still in real, real estate. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so if you could go back, you know, if you could go back before, maybe before you even were, was a teacher, you know, what would you tell yourself before you, you know, would you say get right into real estate then and what type of real estate would it be? Well, for one, no, I definitely would not tell myself to go get into real estate because that would have been like 2004 or five. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so hindsight timing like could have been better. It obviously worked out really well. I would caution people trying to get into any type of real estate right now. It'd be very, very careful. Um, I wouldn't say don't do it. I would definitely say go ahead and invest. Um, but what I would say is be very uh, low, lower your leverage expectations and make sure you have a lot of capital um, available. So over raise. Um, if you think you're going to need um, 
whatever. If you want six months of reserves instead of six months of reserves, use 12 months of reserves. Mm. Um, you know, just over, over raise. And now, so, so anyways, advice, if I were to give myself advice, um, boy, I, I mean, I would, I would say a couple things. One is educate yourself more. Okay. So I learned enough to start and then I, kind of stopped learning and just kept on doing, right? So continue to educate yourself. Always educate yourself. Always keep on learning. I, I, I actually wish I would have. And I, so I never took any guru courses. I never had any coaching. Uh, I never did anything like that. I actually wish I would have, um, but hindsight is hindsight. Um, so I would, I would maybe do a little bit of that. Uh, there was no bigger pockets at that time. So, you know, the education was just out of a book. Uh, that's how I learned. Um, so I would say educate myself more. And I would say, uh, now again, this is a different time. This isn't today. This is 2008. I would say buy more, like just buy, uh, every deal that makes sense <laughs> is fine. Uh, but I would say go bigger too. That's the other mm -hmm. thing you know, I was buying one to four families. I would be buying, uh, you know, 100, 200, 300 deals as quickly as I could. Uh, nice. For some reason, I felt like I had to graduate. Like I had to get there somehow and like doing all these single family houses was going to graduate me to a 50 unit or, or a 200 unit building eventually. It, it's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this limiting belief everybody has that we have to do a few single family. I've had people tell me the same thing. Well, don't, don't you think you should do a few single family homes before you do a, you know, a larger complex or something like that? Uh, and but, is that a bad thing to do a, a couple? No, it's not a bad thing, but it's, it's, there's very little relationship between a single family house and a multifamily building. And so if it just makes people feel comfortable. Great. Go, go ahead and, and buy a duplex or a fourplex. Um, that, that's the only thing I would say it, it really does is makes your investors feel a little more comfortable. It, mm -hmm. Once you buy a, you can say, Oh, I bought a four, I got a fourplex and I got a, a 10 unit building and I got a 15 unit building. And now we're going to buy this hundred unit building. It makes people feel a little more comfortable with you, but. Sure. So kind of in that same line, what, what are some, I mean, you, you've met numerous people in this business now. What are some top reasons you see a syndicators fail? Um, or maybe big mistakes that, that are common. Yeah. I'll say or maybe big, uncommon. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see some mistakes that um, people make is, is one, they think that just they're going to find a deal and it's going to bring in the money. And to me, that's very false. Um, you have to have the relationships already. You don't necessarily have to have the money in your pocket. Uh, but if you don't have relationships built, if you don't have trust built and you just find this great deal, the money is not going to find the deal. Now, the money might find the deal if you can just sell it to somebody, right? If you, could just, you, find, if you find a great deal and you can't take it down, send it to me, I'll buy it, right? But it doesn't mean I'm going to give you much for it. <laughs> it doesn't mean I'm going to give you the money you know, I might pay you a, a, a little fee. Uh, so to don't, don't just assume that you have, the, the money will find the deal. Um, so I see, I see that. I, I just saw it the other day. Somebody said they got a hundred and whatever, 120 unit or whatever it was under contract. And they need to raise $2 million. And right now they only have like, it was only like a few hundred thousand dollars raised and they're looking for the rest. And it's like, what? You're posting this publicly for one that you shouldn't do that. Um, unless you did the, did the right offering. But two is like, you need to have the money, at least an idea of, can you raise the money first? So go out there and build the relationships first, listen to this podcast, understand how to do it, what to do, build those relationships, get yourself to where you think, Hey, I can at least raise that money and then go and do it. Um, there's people out there that'll help you raise money uh, and partner with you, build relationships with them. I mean, there's so many people out there, so much money out there. Just build those relationships. I think that's really a huge mistake. The other mistake I would say people make is they don't, they're too aggressive in their, in their underwriting. 
They're way too aggressive. I think people are doing that right now. They're just trying to get a deal. Emotionally, they just want to get a deal. They want to get their first deal. They see that uh, the acquisition fee, you know, a lot of people will charge a 2% acquisition fee, but 2% on 10 million, that's a nice payday, right? And so that, that's attractive. That's sexy. So I, I want to get this deal done. I want to make my couple hundred grand. Um, and, you know, that's what I'm looking at. I'm not looking at this whole deal from start to finish. And is it really, truly, can I actually make these numbers uh, that I am projecting to my investors? And so I think that's really important too. And I think people are making that mistake. We'll find out, I guess. We will. <laughs> um, tell us, uh, tell us some things that you're excited about right now. Maybe some things that are happening in your, in your business or you're working on right now. Um, yeah. So, I mean, some things I'm excited about. I mean, I've got a couple projects right now I'm really excited about that we're doing um, that I think are going to be very, very good for our investors. Uh, I've I, beyond that. I mean, the, there's there's future deals uh, likely that'll that'll be exciting. But beyond that, I, right now I'm building a. I've got a. So I've got. I've had my contractor's license forever, and I used to do a lot of that when I was um, uh, doing a lot of flips. But I kind of let that kind of go and. Uh, I still have the contractor license. So what I'm actually doing right now is just building that up. And, and so while this market is continuing to, to uh, be hot and then, you know, expand, my goal right now is to get this construction company up and running, be doing a lot of third party construction, um, building another arm of my business. And, uh, and same thing with potentially bringing on some real estate agents and I've got a real estate license as well. So, so potentially bring on some real estate agents and building kind of that multiple streams of income. But when, when there is that, uh, you know, down cycle, I'm now will have my crews all built up. And so it's just building different legs of my business. That I'm excited about to you. Know, I think a very important part of, of business is making sure that, there's different cycles, right? Everybody knows that. There's different market cycles. And whether we're talking multifamily or anything, doesn't matter. There's different market cycles. So making sure that you're going to be doing well in every market cycle, I think is really important. The best time to buy multifamily is when? You know, when, when the market's down um, at the bottom. That's the best time. The best time to be doing construction, contracting, third-party contracting is when? Well, it's at the top of the market. Okay, so... I can now, when I've got those two, and same thing with real estate agents, the best time to be a real estate agent is at the top of the market. So now not only will I have a great business at the bottom of the market, I should have you know, a good couple businesses at the top of the market. So I'm just excited about doing that and, and building those. That's smart. Sounds like a good plan. I'll be interested to see how it's working, you know, a year or so from now, I'll maybe have you back on. Um, yeah. Tell, tell Vert vertically them. integrating businesses, I think can be very, very good and very strategic if you can do it properly. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you, Todd, learn more about your business. Yeah, sure. Well, there's a couple of ways. Um, I've got a podcast as well. So after they listen to yours, they can go on, on to mine. It's called Pillars of Wealth Creation. They can find it on iTunes or whatever. They can just Google my name. Um, if they want to learn more about my syndication business, they can, uh, they can go on to venturedproperties.com. Uh, and in there, they can, you know, learn all about it and, and connect with me and, um, or, of course, just Google my name and they can look me up on, on uh, LinkedIn as well. So uh, that's a great place to connect to. It's great. Thank you so much for being on the show, Todd, and uh, appreciate all the listeners listening today. And we will talk to each of you tomorrow. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.